All right, what's up, Bruins fans, and welcome back to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast, sponsored by the BB Lux Transportation Company. If you need a private car service to and from the greater Boston area, please call BB Lux at 798-701-1473 to schedule your next trip today. This is Season 8, Episode 355, and I'm your host, Mark Allred, and that is my uh, co-host, Dom Tiano. Dom, how you doing, and how you been the last two weeks, bud? Doing great, doing great, no complaints. A lot of hockey nice. to watch. It's always good. Always yeah. good to have the hockey on. We're not we're not gonna have it much longer, man. So we gotta soak up as much as oh, as much as possible. There is always hockey. Just ask this guy up here. <laughs> Absolutely. And joining us once again is uh is friend of the show, returning guest, uh Parker McLean. Um Parker is the host of the On the Fly YouTube channel. And please give Parker a follow on Twitter. At on the fly one five one five. That's at on the fly fifteen fifteen. And please subscribe to his YouTube channel by clicking the link in the show notes. I'll have later when we release this episode. But this is this is episode three fifty five. It's a live stream. We're gonna start. I think we're gonna start doing this more often because we love. We've we've been hearing a lot of interaction saying we love the live streams and so on. But I'm still gonna be putting it out on on audio platforms and 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 the YouTube channel and everything. So. But uh, uh, sorry for babbling, Parker. Thank you very much for joining me. How you doing? Doing good. Been busy, but uh, always a good day when you're busy, right? Four hour exam today, big guy. What's up with that? Yeah. Oh, you know how it goes. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing that keeps you from a little bit of hockey. That's right. I don't know how it goes. I I never got past grade three. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, people, this guy's hockey coverage. And what he does is top notch. If you're not following him, follow him. His coverage the last few days of the uh, Women's World Championship, the best I've seen out there. So give this guy a follow. Awesome work, Parker. Thanks, Dom. Yeah, and, and and the other guy that you I got connected to from your coverage, he was doing a great job as well. I've been just like retweeting and, and reading all you guys' stuff. So yeah, great, great stuff. And just another a, a way of getting women's hockey out there. You know, it's it's a growing, it's growing and it's great. And I hopefully, you know, people grasp onto it and, and the NHL does too to really support that because it does deserve to be fully funded in a way like the the men's game. So um I do want to remind folks that if you do want to interact with our program, you can always send us a, uh, a voicemail at a listener hotline at 978-504-2727. And always on the X on the Twitter, please use the hashtag AskBNG if you want to uh, send us a, a question ahead of time. We're always interested in, uh, in interacting with folks and you know reading, feeling the, uh, the, the uh, fan base out there. And obviously, we're always looking for more content creators, either start a new hockey po sports related podcast or on our Cyclone Sports Podcast Network, network or join the team as a website writer and credential media opportunities. Send me an email at black and gold productions LLC at gmail.com. But uh, yeah, so let's get started, huh? Um, so it's been a while since we've been on the pod waves, about two weeks. So let's start with our thoughts on this Boston Bruins team in the last seven games. Uh, where they went five and two, they have three games remaining in the 2023-24 regular season. Um, thoughts on what we have left, and um, what can we expect for the uh, the upcoming postseason? Parker, you go first, buddy. Sure. So, I mean, when we look at it, right, we got a we got a team here that's looking like they're going to make a a decent run this year. When we look at it, I mean. They're four lines strong. I wouldn't say there's any one particular line I'm looking at to really sort of provide that offense compared to previous years, you know, where you had that top line. But at the same time, you know, you got a four line team, a pretty solid defensive core and two goaltenders that seem to be running hot, especially as of late. So we'll see if they can keep it going here. And then I think in general, you know, we look at where they are in the standings. There's still the potential for them to come first in that Eastern Conference, take the the wild card two seed. But there's really no team here that has that sort of standalone um, sort of roster that's really going to set them apart in the playoffs. I don't believe. I think any team that you're going to play is going to be top notch and uh, definitely sort of going to be a tough matchup heading into the playoffs here. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because uh, 
uh, warning, warning to everybody is be careful what you wish for. Like I remember last year, everybody wanted to face Florida because, you know, they were the eighth seed. And to me, that was the team that scared me the most. So um, what I wanted to see over the last couple of weeks is the team trending in the right direction, playing the right way. Uh, they've been playing in some what we'll call playoff caliber games. And then they throw up the stinker against Carolina. Um, you know, I always said they were going to go five, one and zero in their last six. And that was the one they were going to lose. So, uh, you know, they're heading the right way. Let's hope they get back on track tomorrow uh, against Pittsburgh and play the way that the way that they need to play. Yeah, and I'll just sort of touch on that as well. When we look at their next two games, they got Pittsburgh and Washington. Both those teams are fighting for that last spot in the playoffs. So it's do or die for them as well. So, you yeah. know, if, if, it's, if you're Boston, you got to you gotta come to play. And if you're going to throw up a stinker, Pittsburgh and Washington would love that. You know, they're looking for any opportunity that they can to get into the playoffs. Any easy points at the end of the day, you know, if you're Boston, you got to come to play or else you're going to get absolutely smoked in those games. Yeah, look what the Islanders and the Flyers did to the Rangers. Two teams desperate for wins, and they took down the best team in the East. Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the things that I'm more concerned about is how this Boston Bruins team is going to bring the physicality. And I'm not talking the the, the glove drop opportunities and, and somebody beating ass, but what it takes to sustain a good playoff and a playoff run for that matter. Um, obviously, we have Pat Maroon, and we'll talk about him later on. But I kind of see, you know, Jim Montgomery calling this team out recently, trying to, you know, they're still searching for their identity. I've heard that a lot from him this year. Um, and, you know, towards the end of the year, towards the end of the season, I was kind of like thinking to myself, I'm like, really? They're they're doing what they can with what they have. And that's impressive. It, it, it has been an impressive year, not as impressive as last year, but when you take two cornerstone pieces like Bergeron and Krejci out and, you know, obviously we had our, we had our, um, uh, doubts on this year. or well, I did anyway. I was just, you know, we're probably going to hold water, but uh, you know, the whole thing, this whole season has just been kind of a, a whirlwind on, on my um, prediction and, and a very bad one at that. But, um, you know, I just want to see this team get more and more physical um, and, and be more engaged uh, and finish the checks and, and, and play that playoff hockey. And I think that the, the scoring will, will come along with it. But the, uh, and another thing is the, is the special teams power play is definitely going to be better. Penalties got to be uh, uh, penalty kill has to be better. Um, but I'm excited regardless. I'm excited and, and hopefully they get out of the first round. Um, that's, that's pretty much all I can say about that. Um, I think, I, do... I think we've seen an increase in the physicality though, Mark, since the, since the Florida game, oh, yeah. um, I think Andrew peak is, is great in that department. You know, we've said all along that, Midland Lucic would al allow this team to play bigger than they are uh, and harder than they really are. Uh, obviously, they didn't have Lucic all season, but in comes Maroon. And trust me, Maroon is going to make them play bigger than they are. I, I think we'll see a continued rise in the physicality from this team from top to bottom. Whether you're David Pasternak or uh, you're Brandon Carlo, uh, I, I think we're we're going to see a continued rise in the physicality. Uh, yeah. uh, real quick, I just want to remind folks that um, I forgot. I wish I mentioned this when we started, but six fifteen tonight is when we're going to start taking uh, questions from our viewers. So uh, please uh, hold all your really important questions until then. We just want to go through a couple. Bruins related topics and then we'll uh we'll get right to you guys and, and thank you very much for tuning in by the way the support has been amazing and so on we see angie we see andre and, and everybody out there so i appreciate the uh patience parker your thoughts on the physicality 
I mean, when you look at it, they're a, I wouldn't say they're a small team, but when you look at some of the other teams, right, they don't necessarily match up in terms of size, but where they are sort of in that is in their spirit, is in their ability to just throw the body, right? At the end of the day, if you play physical, it doesn't matter how big you are because you're going to eventually draw players in. There's no better example of that for me, at least for Brad Marchand, who Mm -hmm. despite being a, a wagering, what, five foot seven, he plays like he's massive. And does he hit people very hard? Probably not, but he's able to get under people's skins. And I think when we look at it in that sense, that's where the Bruins sort of have to play in that in that sort of realm. Because when we look at it, I mean, they, they, they went on and got peak at the deadline. They got Maroon. Both those players are going to be playing physical hockey. And they, and they wanted to try and get people to bolster up their bolster up their lineup to be able to play against some of the, the more skilled teams. You look at a potential first round matchup with the Leafs. Whenever the Leafs play and they're able to play free, they're going to put the puck in the back of the net. But if you can get them into those, you know, corners where you're sort of pushing them around, that's where, you know, Boston's able and all these years have been able to sort of beat the Leafs in that in that respect. At the end of the day, but what Boston has to do is they have to play some phys- in some physical sense. I think the additions of both Peak and Maroon will, or, or will definitely help that along. So while I'm looking at Derek Forbert, he was in a non-contact jersey today. If they're able to get him back, I think you know Boston is just going to take that next step in terms of size, really be able to push teams around, and it might be uh, at least a little bit more physical and, and just with that whole mentality of it. Interesting. Because... Um, Man, I, I, I'm really liking that third pairing of Wortherspoon and, and, and Peak. You know, and, and it's also impressed the first uh, a coach like Jim Montgomery. So um, I, I hate to see that broken up, but that's a guy that's like playoff style freaking hockey right there for me. Yeah, and, but and you, know, you, you, you say the, the PK is one area that needs to improve, and Derek <laughs> Forber does that. So that's true. Like you, you've got to weigh all your options and what the team needs. Uh, and um, a healthy Derek Forbert for me is in over a, a healthy Parker Waterspoon. And another guy I'll look at too there is also with Matt Grizzlick, right? Where yeah. he in the playoffs has been notoriously healthy scratched because of his more or less inability to play physical. You throw a guy like Derek Forbert on that line with Carlo. And there, all of a sudden, you have that sort of massive pairing that you're looking for. Could make for an interesting physical line, especially when you put up against, you know, say in that first round, they have to play Matthews, Marner, and Tavares, or Nylander, whoever they put on that that ultra first line that they've been liking to do recently. It might make for an interesting game when you're going to be pushing around their star players all night. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, and and... We got to get to this one because now we're, we're now we're talking about who you know the Bruins could possibly play. But if the Stanley Cup playoffs started today, um, when the Bruins face the, uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, or... if the, if they finish if the standings finish the way they are today, yes. But okay. there's nothing written in stone. Absolutely okay. nothing. They they okay. could face they could face Toronto. They could face the Islanders. They could face. Pittsburgh, they could face Washington, Detroit, Philadelphia. All of them are the only thing we know for sure is they can't face the Rangers or Carolina in round one. That's the only okay. thing that, that's certain. And and yeah. Florida too. Right. Uh oh. no, mathematically Toronto can still catch oh, Florida. Could. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, right. So it's pretty much like the wild, wild west out in the Eastern Conference right now. Trying to, and I've never that. seen it this tight this late in the season. Never. With yeah. with so much, usually you can narrow it down to two, maybe three teams. Yeah, but not this year. I was hoping that we could preview, do like a playoff preview, but it just it it it's coming down to, you know. Well, the- I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. Tomorrow afternoon, it, the Islanders face the Rangers. Okay, if the Islanders win that in regulation, okay, uh, the the Rangers, the Rangers will have one game left. The Bruins will have three. Okay, doesn't if the Bruins win outright, it doesn't matter what happens between the Rangers and Ottawa in their game. The Bruins will take first place 
and we'll meet now. If the Islanders do beat them, the Islanders will have clinched third, so there's no way the Bruins could face them. So it would either be uh, Pittsburgh, Washington, Detroit, or Philadelphia. Wow. And like Andrew said earlier, that it, how crazy it is it for um, the first round opponent is uh, completely uncertain. Sorry, I can't yep. get my words out today. No, I, I, I don't like the idea of facing Tampa just because Vasilevsky, to me, is still the best goaltender in the world. Put him in the playoffs. What was it? 60% of NHL players said in a one-game, winner-take-all game, Vasilevsky's their goalie. Yeah. And I think the yeah. number two came in at 6%. Yeah, he's crazy good. And especially in the playoffs, right, where – more or less one game can be the turning point in a series. Yeah. You don't want to have to have your staring down the other ice, the one of the best goalies we've seen in quite a while. Right. And just in the playoffs, you know, stakes are at an all time high teams are playing defensive hockey and you're trying to go up against a really solid goaltender and that we've seen it. And not just the NHL, but in any tournament or any double IHF mm -hmm. event you go to in the Olympics, one hot goaltender can win you not just the series, but sometimes even the entire entire thing, right? So yeah. at the end of the day, you got to be careful of what you wish for. Sort of to Dom's point off the top, you can't pick a team that you want to go up against because they're going to turn out like Florida and they're going to beat you. And it's funny yeah. you say that, Parker, because like I've been funny following the J20 in Sweden for a couple of years now because there's been Bruins prospects playing there. And it's funny because you take uh, Kostadinsky's team and Nason's team, or they played on the same team, uh, finished, I think, ninth out of 10 teams, but they were all in the playoffs. But the top teams got to pick their opponent. And the first two teams that picked the, picked them to go up against were knocked out yep. <laughs> they knocked them out so it, you know the game is still played on the ice it's not on not on paper um so picking an opponent doesn't doesn't always work out for you yeah there's two teams that i that worry me and it's tampa bay and toronto now toronto i think i think is winnable because they don't have the goaltending but, well, lately they have. Right, right, right. No, I, I get that. But, and we've talked about this several times on this program, Dom. Toronto is going to get their chance to beat Boston sooner or later. It's, 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 and I, I don't ever want it to happen, but karma works in freaking weird ways. You know what I'm saying? And obviously Tampa Bay with how, <coughs> you know, they can be, you know, they've had a pretty tough season, you know, being in a wild card position and so on and get, just getting to the playoffs, but they could be that Jekyll Hyde type of team and just turn it on. I mean, they have the, they have the committee to do it with Kucherov and, and Brandon point and, you know, Hedman and, and, and Vasilevsky. We just talked about the goaltending that, that is just a, a huge, huge factor for a team like that. Um, it, so those, those are the two teams that, that worry me the most, uh, I was hoping we would see somebody else make it a little easier while everybody else kinds of fights its way out. But why not go uh, the belly at the beast first and see what you got? <laughs> Angie's right. telling Angie's telling me to shut my mouth. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Islanders scare me. Tampa first and then the Islanders. They would yeah. scare me in a first round matchup. Parker, you got two? Uh, I mean, Toronto for me is just a personal scare because every year I got to deal with whatever the result is. Either people are angry at me because Boston won or the other thing, which I've never actually seen happen. So it really doesn't yeah. matter anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the other team, I mean, when you look at it, Florida is another scary one. Probably not likely to happen. Toronto would have to win out. Boston would lose. And Florida would also not get any points. So there's that. But at the same time, you know, Florida is a team that's, you know, they, they've done it right. And they believe now they've got some extra players in 
they've grown their team a lot more from the previous year. So mm-hmm. I think they're a team that, you know, shouldn't be taken lightly. And, and I think they are better, a lot better than they were last year at this time. Sure. Uh, moving on to another topic. How about Jesper Boquist um, and his ability to play well, come up from the uh, a recall from the American Hockey League Providence Bruins, <laughs> earn a spot on the fourth line, but play well in that role to earn uh, some third line minutes. Um, where do we see him fitting moving forward with the, the, the next couple of games of the regular season and, and into the playoffs? I mean, is he the type of, play that Jim Montgomery feels real comfortable at third line center, or is that going to be a, uh, somebody else's? And we're just trying to see if we can find consistency right now with, with how versatile Boquist can be. He, hear me out, Parker, before you jump in with your, your suggestion. I would like to see a third line of Trent Frederick, John Beecher, and Morgan Geeky. And I would like to see Bolquist uh, center the fourth line with Maroon, simply because Bolquist has more experience, is as fast as, as Beecher, and can be solid defensively to help. I don't want to use the word cover up, but make up some of Maroon's deficiencies in getting back. Okay. If, if there's a in zone face off that has to happen. Well, first of all, uh, if, if Maroon's on the line, they're not getting a whole lot of defensive zone starts to begin with, but in the event, you could always send Beecher or somebody else take the draw and then make the quick switch to Bolquist. I don't know what you guys uh, I, think. I agree with you, Dom. And I think when we look at it down below when you have Maroon, I think can play on that right side. I look at Lauko as another player who's been a little shaky late as of late, but you know, he has the, that sort of raw talent that I'm always seeing in your articles, right? Where it's, mm. he's got the skills to really sort of take it to the next level. It's just sometimes he um, just sort of, sometimes he can't, sort of find those lanes or, or whatnot, depending on the game. Another guy I could see sliding in there when we look at Boakvist, because at the end of the day, Boakvist is a guy who can sort of play with anybody, right? And we've seen it. He's a guy that has the skills and has that capability to play alongside whoever he needs to. So I think a guy like uh, JVR is another one, right? Who's sort of been there, done that in his career. He's on the, he's on the older side too. So he provides a little bit more to that, of that calm to a line where if you want to stick him with Maroon and you can make a good old fashioned veterans line, you could throw Boakvist in there to give it a little bit of spring to the step almost. And I was also reading an article today about how we should be thanking the New Jersey Devils for Boakvist at the end of the day, because there was yeah. the, not only did we get our, our star second or first line center with Pavel Zaka, uh, in that Eric Holla trade, but in the, I'm pretty sure it was the same year, or maybe it was a, another ha- year after that, but with uh, Boakvist coming over. So big thanks to the New Jersey Devils, I guess. Yeah. Still, that trade still playing so many dividends. And I, I liked, I liked Eric Holla too. I thought he was a hard worker, but I think that he was, a, um, I don't know, a project of, of his environment. You know what I mean? Uh, I think that he was always kind of like that bottom um, line type of guy, but um, I, I like what Morgan Geeky's doing right now, you know. Um, yeah, I think you. I've got. I think you've got to keep Frederick and Geeky together since they've been apart. They've both gone cold, but they just work so well together uh, that I think you have to keep them as a duo. And where's, where does Danton Heinen fit on that? I leave him where he is. Yeah, okay. I leave him where he is. Uh, the line's working. Um, oh, why break it up? Like, he can be the defensive conscience of that line. He'll still put up points because he's playing with De- David Pasternak. Um, so I would leave it the way it is. Yeah. And and speaking of Danton Heinen, I just wanted to kind of transition this into nominated for the Bill Masterton Trophy, 
uh, which is an award given annually to the player who best exemplifies the quality of perseverance, sportsmanship, and dedication to the game of hockey. Uh, what a choice for the Boston Bruins, you know. Um, a lot of haters out there probably not going to like this, but this is a guy that absolutely worked his bag off to be a part of this Boston Bruins team. He probably had several other options to go elsewhere, um, Europe, <laughs> you know, uh, even another NHL team, but felt confident here um, that he was going to get a contract and so on. So, you know, I commend him for his hard work, his determination, and willing to be patient <laughs> with Jim Montgomery and, and that lineup and, and how to, uh, you know, insert him in uh, appropriately. And I thought that all parties did a great job. And, and he's he's definitely produced to a point where he's changed a lot of minds of people that, that really did not like him here before. But and to be honest with you, this is the same player that was before. It's just we're seeing a, a different version now because he's been away so so long. But I, I, I think his placement on this team has been really good. And, you know, and also probably a seventh player award winner, in my opinion. You know, um, we'll see what happens with that. But I don't, I don't know think there's mean. anybody on the team more deserving. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, of either award. Um, it doesn't mean he's going to win it. There's guys around right. the league, right, that that yeah, probably are different. more deserving. But, uh, yeah, I don't think there's anybody on the Bruins roster more deserving. Thoughts, Walker? I know I agree with all of that. I mean, you've seen his his rise like the last couple months too, right? I mean, he's played I think seventy one games now, and uh, he's signed in October of October of this year, and he's sort of just taken off from there, right? He's he started on on those low lines, and now he's playing on a second line pairing on a nearly first place team in the East. So. When we look at it, I mean, there's not too much more to say there, right? He's just, it's a, it's a good feel good story to, uh, to sort of hang your hat on. Yeah. Um, I do definitely agree. Uh, Kevin Paul DuPont tweeted out or X'd out on the, uh, the other day, uh, last season when the Bruins had Patrice Bergeron and David Krejci both combined for 114 points in the regular season with the departures of both potential hall of famers. Uh, Charlie Coyle and Pavel Zaka have 114 points this season. So here's my question for you both, because this seems to be one of the triggering <laughs> aspects of, a, of an argument on Bruin Twitter. Do, do we need to address the center position immediately with their departures and what we've seen this year? Or... Do we need to start looking for replacements for a player like Brad Marshan or or anywhere else on the wings? Because for me, and I'll just say quickly, while I do believe in some prospects, I'm not totally sure about their NHL longevity in Boston. Um, first of all, I like to just say stats can be manipulated without context to to make your point yeah they had 114 points uh patrice bergeron was a plus 35 um david krejci was a plus i forget 23. now right uh coils a minus two he's back up to zero as of or today he's back up to zero like we could play the stats game all night long and Kevin Paul DuPont can manipulate it to make his argument. I can manipulate it to make my argument. It, that's just the way stats are. To answer your question, they're always looking for the future. Always. It's going to be hard to find another Patrice Bergeron. Uh, it's going to be hard to find another Brad Marchand. Um, you're not going to find them in free agency. Players like that just don't come up with free agency. So they need to look elsewhere um, and develop them. 
Now, they've got a couple of years with Marshan. They'll work on it. Who's who's to say, and I'm just going to throw a name out there for the sake of throwing a name out there. Who's to say Trevor Kuntar couldn't be that guy? Right. Because Trevor Kuntar is what Brad Marshan was in junior. Okay? So yep. it, it's not th- that the Bruins aren't, consciously thinking about this they're they need to find the path to find these guys but they are aware that they need to replace these guys <clears throat> parker what are your thoughts bud um i mean I, it's hard to say if that's a right now problem right when we look at a team that to be honest wasn't expected to do anything this year sure enough their first place in the league So there's clearly something working, and I always bring it back to the culture argument, right, of how is Boston doing this right now, and that's because they've got a culture in place. No need to rock the boat quite yet. Free agency comes, might be a completely different story, right? Maybe they lose a big piece, and all of a sudden the the team's shaken up, everything everything goes downhill, and they need a big shakeup. Maybe you make a a move then. It's hard to say right now. I I just think it's really hard to sort of – say immediately that they need to make a big move to address it. Yeah, because no, they've, they, they've got a franchise goaltender in waiting in Jeremy Swayman. They've got a franchise defenseman in Charlie McAvoy. They've got a superstar forward and franchise forward in David Pasternak. Uh, they have a potential number one center in waiting in Matthew Patra. Um, you know, I like John Farinacci to Great. someday be, become a number two centerman behind Patra. But that's a few years down the road. But you still have Coyle. You still have Zaka for that time. So it's, they're trying to find these pieces, but they're not going to suck. That that core is in place. Right. No, and that's what I kind of meant was like, you know, I mean, I mean, we're not, they're not like elite centermen out there because those, you know, obviously those cost money. But, you know, I, I think Coyle's value at $5 million is is decent. And I also, I mean, Zaka's um, value is just, you know, that's a mastermind by Don Sweeney right there. Um, but it gives them flexibility to do things elsewhere as well. It's it for me, the off season, I mean, the, the, um, uh, free agencies real thin this year for me, Mm -hmm. that's just my opinion. Um, but you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of think that addressing the wing would be, or, I mean, what are they going to have? $21 million in in available gas space. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many options that you can go. You could, you know, sign a bunch of your guys right now and so on. But and I just don't see a centerman coming in here with the stuff that we have in, internally. No. And now, let's maybe I forget Zaka is Zaka hasn't even entered his prime yet. Right. Right. How crazy is that? 2015 draft pick. Yeah. He hasn't even entered his prime yet. So, um, you know, yeah, I'd be looking for a winger, preferably a left winger. And I I still have faith in Fabian Lysel to be a number two right winger behind Pasternak. Um, and quite frankly, I move on from Jake DeBrusque and try and find a left winger behind Brad Marchand. Yeah. Uh, a little update on Fabian Lysel. Um, no injury update, but I will say that Mark Diver has been reporting several times that he's been in a sling. Um, mm-hmm. He did take the um, the uh, the team photo the other day, but um, immediately went right right back into the sling. So uh, no no you know defined injury update as of right now, but that's where we are, uh, and, and it sucks because. That's two years in a row late in the mm-hmm. year that he's uh, got knocked out. So, um, but I mean, there's 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 a good future for him this year. 
I think this this off season, let him get healthy, let him work out, hopefully stay in Boston like we talked about a couple episodes. Don't go back home. Stay in Boston, stay with the team, and then really try to like force yourself into the Bruins lineup next year. I think that this is a a big off season for him. You know, it's a put the big boy pants on and and let's freaking go because um and like 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 uh Ryan Mujanel said in one of our videos you know, time's running out on some of these players. It's, you know, you, you got to either put up or shut up. So, and I agree yeah. with that. I like, and I no like Bruins, approach. no Bruins Academy or whatever the fuck it was following him around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> go, yeah, go. Pretty... You know what? Take a page out of Matthew Patra's off season workout. Like he did last year and go do that. And, make an impact next year absolutely and uh and you know i i, I can't I'm more on board with moving to Bross now I, I i just i don't know if he's going to be that type of impact player in these playoffs i just haven't seen any consistency there was a time when he was getting good and then just kind of tailed off his game's still there his speed's still there and so on but um, when it when it comes down to the nitty gritty of the postseason, you got to put the puck back in the net. You know that's what ultimately yeah, but he helps does, you win games. He does that in the playoffs. Well, even, hopefully they did. Even when he has a bad regular season, he shows up in the playoffs. I mean, but part of the problem, what, right? Is he's just so streaky, and at the end of yeah. the day, he's either he's either going to hit his stride in the playoffs or he isn't. And that's and that's what we've seen. I think it was. The past five games or seven games, he's I, he maybe an assist, and then the ten games before that, he was like thirteen points or fifteen points, and it, it, it's just he hits it when he hits his stride and he finds what he's trying to do. He's lights out, and, and he and to be honest, he fits exactly where the Bruins need him to. It's just that doesn't happen as often as they'd like to. He's not a, he's not Pasternak where you know you count on him for the big goal. It's are you hot right now? If you're hot, then we're going to count on you. But if you're not, then I guess we're, we're down the wayside at this point. Okay. Let me ask you guys this because Brad Marchand has gone cold too. And, uh, you know, I guess the thinking was, uh, DeBrus going cold made Marchand cold. No, they went cold at the same time and they're still cold. And now Frederick has gone cold because Geeky's up playing with with Marshan, and it's like messed everything up. Put Geeky back with Frederick. Let them get their game back. Put DeBrusque back with Marshan. Let the, let them get their game back because yeah. obviously they're not working out of it apart. They're just bringing everybody else down. That's true. What are your thoughts on that? For sure, and that's what they did today, actually. In the in, the, I think the morning skate or whatever the the current lines are, is that they have Marshawn, Coyle, and DeBrusque together on that top pair. And I think when you look at it, as you said, Dom, just anything to get that spark going as best they can. And you know, you put someone with the speed of DeBrusque on that right side with Marshawn. We've seen it work before, back mm -hmm. in uh, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before, but they said, you know what, we're gonna try something different. That was about. I think that might have been actually the first time that that top line of Bergeron, Marshawn, and Pasternak didn't go together. And sure enough, I believe it was, I think, it, I can't remember who scored the hat trick, but I remember there was that big hat trick and I was like, okay, this might, this might just work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, transition into one of our last topics I do want to talk about is uh, Boston Bruins prospect Reed Dick, uh, goaltending prospect that uh, has been just amazing this season. Uh, two injuries, one to start the year. One in the middle of the year, came back healthy, and just from that point, the middle of the season, came right into the playoffs, uh, looking looking like a a guy that's uh, on a mission uh, to do something uh, really good for uh, himself. Um, obviously, his um, his upside and um, in the uh, Swift Current Broncos organization, who hasn't been this far, I don't believe, since 2018 when they won it all. Um, but, um, uh, Reed is, uh, four and oh, he has a, uh, 2.30 goals against average, a 0.927 save percentage, um, a shutout in game one in the, in the sweep against the Lethbridge Hurricanes. Um, 
unreal. And and if anybody, uh, I also got to shout out uh, Connor Geeky, Morgan's brother. Um, this guy has been a, a, a buzzsaw out there, uh, real creative, uh, can can put the puck in the net. Uh, but he's also the Central Division MVP, uh, and that that was that's impressive when you get an accolade like that. And um, also, I mean, just my time watching this year and, and you know, because I, I follow Reed a lot. Um, I was really impressive with the defenseman, uh, Owen Pickering. That guy, that oh, guy yeah. is, a, he is so top damn notch. good. Top, top so, notch defenseman. Uh, so th- good. That Swift Current team is built to win. Simple as that. They, from the net out, they're built to win. They went out and acquired Geeky in a trade. Um, I don't know how much you get to watch them, Parker. I, I know you watch them uh, a lot, Reed. The, the post-game celebrations between Dick and Geeky, it's it's like watching the Swayman uh, all-mark hug, except they don't hug. They do something differently. I'll let you guys look it up for yourselves if <laughs> you want to know. But it's every game after a win. Um Dick's numbers aren't up there with some of the other goalies in the playoffs right now. Uh, but I'll tell you what, he's facing more shots and he's, he's doing what the team needs him to do. And that's keep him in games. And uh, that's all you want your goaltender to do. I said it months ago uh, that he is Swift Curtis, most valuable player. Has been, despite the time he missed, because you compare their record with him and without him, it's astronomical. It's like night and day. And then him and uh, Dick and Geeky were named co-winners of of, uh, most valuable players. So, yeah, he means a lot to them. I expect that the minute uh, they're eliminated, he signs his entry-level contract. (coughs) Uh, he's 20, right, Mark? Yes, this is his 20 year. So my guess is that uh, his contract will start for next season and then he'll sign an ATO to be able to go to Providence. He's not going to play in any games. Don't get me no. wrong. He's not getting thrown in in the playoffs ahead of Bussy, Bussy or Di Pietro. But to be part of a team... And, but I'm not, I'm not expecting Swift Current to get knocked out. Uh, they could win the championship. They're not winning the Memorial Cup. Right. Uh, there, there's no way. There's, there's two juggernauts in the OHL with Saginaw in London. Um, they, they're not beating them. And uh, if you want to watch Reed Dick and, and the Swift Current Broncos, uh, please, I think it's $9.99. Go to watch uh, or chl.ca or .tv. Um, chltv.ca. Yeah, and uh, and and check it out. It's really cool. Um, that actually starts tonight. Uh, the second round for the Swift Current Broncos starts tonight against the. Um, oh my God! Oh, the Moose Jaw Warriors. Yeah, nine p.m. Eastern time. That's right. So. All right, let's uh let's hit our commercial break. Let's hear from BB Lux, and we'll we'll get those um these uh viewer questions uh out there. So uh, start typing in some questions, and we'll answer them for the re- remainder of the program. So let's hear from our show sponsor, and we'll be right back with those listener questions. If you're looking for a safe and reliable ride to the airport or planning a trip to Boston for a sporting event for groups of up to 15 people, we highly recommend the BB Lux Transportation Company. This five-star family-run business is the number one private car service of the UMass and Hearst Parent Group and is dedicated to making sure you have the best traveling experience for any occasion, whether your trip is for business or pleasure. Please call BB Lux today at 978 701 
1473 to schedule your ride to and from anywhere in the greater Boston area. You can also send this transportation company an email at bbluxforless at gmail.com. Please give them a follow on Facebook by searching BB Lux and tell them Black and Gold Productions sent you. All right, back talking bees, and um, let's get some uh, some questions from the viewers in the chat. Aha, Andrew, and thank you, Andrew. Uh, Andrew's coming in with, with this. Uh, not a playoff related question, but more of a college free agents. Anyone on your list that you think Sweeney could Sweeney and company might be in on that you have heard? I haven't heard anybody. I haven't heard anybody uh, specifically, but uh, um, Ryan Kerwin was one. I know they had interest in him. Uh, they even invited him to development camp last summer, but he entered the uh, transfer uh, portal today, so it looks like he's returning uh back to school for next year because he's in he's looking for a transfer so um that's the one that i know that they had interest in yeah and with the contracts what 49 or 50 right now doesn't matter they oh, can sign matter? up for next year. no it's a contract for next year okay all right but I think I, I'm not sure if Andrew was asking if they're looking at anybody right now. Or is it still the same? Still the same. I mean, okay. they okay. sign him. They sign him now, but the contract takes effect next year. Okay. You can sign same a guy. To, you can sign a guy to an ATO this year. Yeah. That's an AHL contract. Has nothing to do with the NHL. I got you. All right, uh, boys from the pods, Snipe and Sully. These guys are always on every week. One of my favorite programs, and I've been addicted to these guys for months. So, But they said, uh, looking ahead to the offseason, the Bruins don't have a draft pick through the first three rounds. Who do you think is a potential trade candidate who could get Boston back into that range? Interesting question. Yeah. Parker, go for it. Yeah. Um, I, I just... It's hard to think that they'd even, you know, they're in a transition year. They're in a transition year this year, uh, despite being f basically first in the East. And the, the, then the question becomes, you know, are they going to try and just keep it going? Right. And I think if it's more of a managerial decision to see if they, if they want to go for it for next year. And I think when we look at the team and sort of how they're built, if they want to send one more final year. You know, I think next year is that year where, they might try and make a move. We've seen it with all Mark who was held at this year's deadline, whether they try and move him, that's still up in the air. Another guy is DeBrusque, whether they try and bring him back. I, I, I just don't know if now is the time for them to sort of try and go into that rebuild after, you know, as a transition year team, whether this was the year for them to sort of try and go into that rebuild. I, I, I don't know if that's sort of where they're going to try and head to, but at the end of the day, of course, that'll be that'll be up to them. And I, I, it's just hard to tell. Yeah, other than Allmark, they got nobody to trade. Unless you're talking about moving McAvoy or Pasternak, nobody is going to get him in, into the second round. Uh, you might be able to do a sign and trade with Jake DeBrusque and pull in the second round pick. But uh, other than that, nobody. And that's also really frowned upon, right? When you pick up yeah. a guy, you sign him right away, and then you get rid of him, right? So yeah, I, I just think that when we look at it that way, it's it's really hard to justify, you know, trying to make a big move, whether you are a contender or not, to try and make a move to try and get someone of that caliber. When I think when we look at it, especially with sort of who's coming up in the system, I, I don't know if they need need to make a move right now, but at the end of the day, of course, that that's still to be determined. Yeah, let's not forget, they, they just signed Bavero out of the NCAA, who is an early third-round 
um, type defenseman. They just signed Jackson uh, Nelson, who is probably a mid to late third talent. And they signed the goaltender Bischel to an AHL contract, who's a late round uh, type project, is similar to Reed Dick, who we just talked about. So um, it's not that they haven't made up the lack of picks. They're just not getting that high-end uh, first rounder. And nothing that they have short of mer- moving Pasternak or McAvoy or Allmark uh, or possibly Lindholm is getting you uh, that first round pick. And I'd argue that Lindholm and Allmark get you a late first round pick, not an early first round pick. <laughs> Why snipe Sally? They, they, these guys are awesome. There's one for you, Dom. If you want to trade Jackson Nelson to the Minnesota Wild, we'll have that deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do you yeah. do? Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one of the hosts, one of the hosts, Dan Bradley, really got great guy. And, and the other host is Joel. Um, two fantastic people. But um, uh, Dan was the one I reached out to about um, that Jackson guy. And he gave me a it gave me a really nice write out that I wanted to use last week, but unfortunately we didn't have a show because of some family issues. But I want to thank Dan personally for for sending that over to me. I really appreciate that, bud. Uh, Jason comes in with the interesting one here. Uh, do you think the defense is set for next year, or do you do they try to bring in someone either through UFA or trade? UFA maybe trade no. I yeah. I don't I don't see this team selling assets that they lack to bring somebody in. If they can find what they need through UFA, they'll do it. Now, unless uh, unless you're talking about them not wanting to re-sign Jake DeBrusque and making him part of the trade, yeah, I can see a trade, but. They're not going to give up assets to go get an asset that they can get through free agency. Yeah, and I'd agree with that too. It's just really hard to justify, right? Whether whether you're a contender or a rebuilder, trying to trade away some of your key assets on your team, it just doesn't make a ton of sense, especially as a team that's already shown you know, that they're capable of making a run in the playoffs maybe not a run in the playoffs, but getting to that spot where they can say, you know, we're a nearly first place team, you know, you got to bet on us at some point. And I think coming to this year's off season, that's going to be what's in the back of Bruins, the Bruins fans minds, Bruins GMs, whoever it might be managerial. But at the end of the day, you're a team that's nearly come first place in the entire league on a transition year. You're going to eventually have to pick up some assets to sort of bring it in. I think, as you said, Dom, UFA is, really the only option they have. They can trade all Mark, but they're probably not going to get the return they're hoping for. But I guess at the end of the day, time will tell here. Hey, and, and um, just a reminder to send us some uh, questions in the live chat and we'll, we'll try to do our best to answer them, but uh, to fill some space right now, I, w- I did want to uh, touch on uh, Mason Lori being sent down to the American hockey league, Providence Bruins. Um, he left uh, practice early this afternoon and headed down to uh, the AMP down in Providence, Rhode Island, um, because the Utica Comets are in town tonight. And uh, I'm going to be watching that game later on. Plus, I'm going to be watching Reed Dick and the Swift Current Broncos later on. Real busy, busy day here for the uh, for me and, and, and the, uh, the hockey watching. But um, some folks uh, had a bit of a, a problem with this move and – I, I, I don't understand why, but I did want to like ask you guys, particularly Dom, about how important it is for a player like Mason at his age and at his developmental level right now, it is to keep him playing and in game shape. I don't I don't think it does him a, a, a justice at all to sit and watch the game. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And then and, and Parker, could you follow? Mason Lorai was not in my starting six playoff lineup. Uh, and we know Forbert was skating today. If Forbert is good to go, 
Uh, Lorai wouldn't even be my first guy in. Um, that said, he's got to be playing. In the event that they do need him, I mean, let's say they were going to, to, to get to the finals. That's four rounds. And if you need him in the final series because of injuries and he's been sitting on the ninth floor that whole time, what good is, what good is he to you? If Jeremy Swayman was no good to you for sitting for six games, what good is Mason Lorai going to be to you sitting for 20 games? Get him in Providence. Providence needs him. Let him play the big minutes there in a playoff atmosphere in the event that he's needed in Boston. And that's my take. And I don't know how anybody can see it any other way. But here will come Parker and give me another way that it'll make sense. Oh, no, I got, I got nothing on you, Dom, for this one. <laughs> but I, it, it, as you said, it's hard to disagree with it. And as much as I try and find fault, it's it, it's a foolproof, right? It, it's just you can't it, – it's hard to disagree with it at the end of the day because he's not playing in Boston. He's not getting better. He's not being into his prime. And even if when you look at it, right, he's a young player, with lots of room to grow. But at the end of the day, if you're sitting on the ninth floor, you aren't playing, you aren't getting the reps in that you're looking for. And much more importantly, they got a big run coming up. And if they are going to need him at any point, as you said, Dom, it's going to be a crucial, he might become a crucial player for the Bruins. If you're not having played a game in, you know, a month or two months, you're probably not going to be ready to go. And I think when we look at it that way, it's a no brainer to send him down to Providence. Yeah. And, and uh, per Mark Diver on his uh, lineup share that he does every game, uh, great follow. Um, he has uh, low ride playing with Ian Mitchell on the top pairing. I mean, that's Good. that's a given right there. That's where he should be. Like, exactly. I know there's a lot of people that think that Mason Lorai is the answer to the Bruins power play woes right now. But he's not. One day he might be. But he's not the answer for it today. Their issues run right. a lot deeper than just one defenseman. And that's one of the things that that I kind of like was talking with a bunch of people online this afternoon was they, they, they think that Mason's better than Shattenkirk and Wotherspoon and all this stuff. And well, that, that might be a fair argument, but also there's a, there's a thing about experience that the coaching staff believes in some of these players that have been through all of these aspects of, uh, playoffs and being Stanley Cup winners, um, so I think that that is going to take a little more precedence over a guy that's only been in the league for a year, and, and not know, even I, a full year. Right, right, up and down and so on. And I'm not knocking Mason for his talent or what he's brought to the table this year. What he's done has been really good, and it gives you really good vibes of how his future is going to pan out. Dom, I've heard you several times saying, I don't want Noah Hannafin. We already have that type of player here. He's going to arrive in a year or two. Be patient. Three. three. Okay. I, I said many times in three years, he'll be a better player than Noah Hannafin. And, right. But I, I, I stick my neck out by saying things like that, but I, I turn around and I admit he's not that right now. He's not the answer right now. Give him time. Exactly. Uh, Beth in the house, she asked a, a very interesting question. Wouldn't Forbert be in the same situation as Lorai <coughs> since Forbert hasn't played in a long time? Um, but I'd, I, I'd argue that it, it isn't really considering Forbert's coming off of injury, right? So when we look at it that way, it's it's a lot tougher for Lowry, who who is healthy, who's just been sitting out for a while, where Forbert is sort of getting back into the stretch of things. In this, in the overall sense, I mean, you could say yes, they are coming back from a long absence. But Lowry is a guy who is young; he has the ability to develop down in Providence where a guy like Forbert is just trying to try and get the reps in before they can 
more or less use him in the playoffs, right? And he's been there. He's done that. He knows what it's going to take. So for a guy like Forbert, who's really looking to get back into the playoffs, that might be, you know, if they if Boston can get a guy like Forbert back, who's, you know, he's been there. He's, he's done it. He's, he's a guy that you can rely upon in the playoffs. It, it's just, it might be, it's a little bit different where you can send a guy back down to Providence and then call him back up. All right. And an NHL right now is not going down to Providence. A lot of people are saying, why is he going down? Send Grizzly. Or, you know, why is he? It just, it, it doesn't happen like that. Um, again, send us some, some questions to answer. This is your time. The floor is yours to the people in the live chat. Let me just scroll up real quick. Andrew, I mean, uh, yeah, Andrew Peterkin says, uh, super excited about low rise future. But he simply isn't defensively strong enough at this stage of his freshman year. Totally agree on that. Uh, Pod Snipe Sully, I want to get to this one. If the Providence Bruins end up playing the Hershey Bears in the AHL playoffs, can Providence pull up the offset, uh, the upset on the Bears headed back to back called the Cups? Um, I don't think so. Oh, I <laughs> and I. Go ahead. I I don't know. Um, Providence defense, even with the addition of 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 Lorai today, is hurting with injuries. Uh, They got Bavero in there, who's played what two games. Yeah. Regula's out for probably the season. Uh, I don't know. Their back end looks like a mess. Lysel does sounds like he's done for the season. Um, if if Providence were to beat them, I I would have to think of a a stronger word than upset, and I'm not sure what that word would would be because Cinderella story. <laughs> yeah, Cinderella mine, story. Mine would be two words: Hori Chet. Yeah, because <laughs> honestly, Mark, can you see Providence even winning a game? I don't know. I, I got to be honest, as a person that, as a Bruins fan, Providence fan, and one that covers the team, eh, I I just think that the the Hershey Bears are an absolute wagon this year. Yeah, and they were last year as well, <laughs> and I don't know. They, they just they have it all the way through and. Um, what a tremendous job from from the uh, Washington Capitals to down to the Hershey Bears, the historic Hershey Bears, the former Boston Bruins affiliate of the uh, yeah a long time ago. Long time um, ago. What a long storied franchise! And I gotta tell you, man, I really love Pennsylvania fans. They go to hockey games. Mm-hmm. They fill the barns. I mean, maybe not so much Wilkes Barre Scranton. I know they do have their their times when their barn looks big. Definitely not on a Wednesday night, but on a Wednesday night at in Hershey and a Wednesday night in like Lehigh Valley, those barns are really really full. So kudos to the to the good uh, uh, Pennsylvania Pennsylvania fans out there. I have to th- while we're waiting for a question. Can I quickly bring up Don's Lock Mellis? Yeah, go for Mark. it. Okay, so. Those that don't know, um, uh, he got knocked out of the NCAA tournament, what, week and a half ago? Two weeks ago now, whatever it was. But he's been in Latvia, Finland, Austria, and he's with the Latvian national team, uh, about to make the roster for the uh, 2024 IHF men's world hockey championship so he's played in four exhibition games now for them uh two against austria two against finland uh they beat austria two times lost in a shootout three to two to finland and lost in regulation three to two to finland so they're gonna have a pretty good team and he's gonna play a big role on that team yeah, I always, I always love watching those tournaments too because they're the always, best. They're there's just so much hockey in such a condensed yeah. amount of time, and it's 
it's like you start the day and they're on, you end the day and they're on, and it's always just a great, great day of hockey. And that starts, I believe, May 5th, I believe is when it starts. 10th, this 10th to the 26th. 10th, 10th yeah. So, and I mean, if was, I maybe you know Parker, but are they not playing on the new um, hybrid ice surface this year? So just a bit smaller than the international, but big, still bigger than the NHL. I, I remember reading that, but I I can't remember if it was for this tournament or another one. They, I think it was this one. They always jump. They always jump though, because like normally in like the Olympic years, they like to try and keep it to the international ice. Yeah, and then it just depends on the years. Uh, Olympics are in twenty six, so I think they'd be sticking with the NHL, but it might be the hybrid one too. Okay. I know I, I know I read something somewhere that the IIHF wants to go um to a, a 200 by 85 or or was it two not or 200 by 90 and keep it very similar to what yeah. is happening over here in North America to kind of seamlessly make that adjustment from European hockey to North, North American hockey a little bit easier uh but with the, with today's freaking athletes uh those adjustments don't take long no, you know, it. Um, I mean, it obviously it's taken Fabian Lysel maybe a little longer, but uh, other athletes uh, not so long. So, um, I want to get to this one. Beth wanted to know: um, Will we see Maroon on the ice before the start of the playoffs, and would he be effective during the playoffs, coming off back surgery? Uh, Beth, um, as of right now, but check in with the report tomorrow. Uh, before the game, uh, but uh, all things are heading towards he's making his debut in Pittsburgh tomorrow at 8 p.m. So, um, like I said, find out tomorrow, check out the uh, the lineup. But uh, I, I think he gets in for at least a game or two, possibly the next three that are in the uh, in the regular season before the postseason, just kind of get him tuned up from there. And and obviously we'll see how it, it – his – placement pans out in the postseason because you know is he a player if we play the tip well we won't play the Tampa Bay Lightning because I already locked that that in but um what team would he like be most um oh I can't even say my words sorry <laughs> I I to answer the part about will he be effective I think he will just for the simple fact that having him in the lineup makes everybody else play bigger. And that's where his effectiveness comes in. To get them to amp up and play playoff-style hockey, and I think that's the reason he's there. And I see Parker's nodding, so he's agreeing with me, right? We're, we're two for two, Dom. We're, we're on two fire for two. Man. Holy shit, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark, so also just to answer your, the question that I think you were going to ask there was which team would be he be most effective against? And I think there's no better team than the Toronto Maple Leafs to have a physical physical front because you've seen it time and time again. When the Leafs have and are forced to play physical, the team falls apart. And, and you look to, I mean, they have some more grinder type players this year. But still, Boston, whenever they play the Leafs, it just seems to be a little bit more physical and the Leafs fall for the trap every single time. So when we're looking at it, who's going to who's going to have problems playing the physical game and what does Maroon provide is that physical side? It's got to be the Toronto Maple Leafs. And that yeah. forces Reeves into the lineup. And anytime you you force Reeves in, onto the ice for more than three minutes a game, that's a bonus to to you. Right. And that's kind of where I was trying to go with that before I, I couldn't get my words out was, you know, like a lot of like when we got Maroon, regardless of of how he was injured and so on in the back surgery, he st I still would have not played him every game of the season when he when he got acquired. I would put him in spot starts, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, just to get him like, adequated and so on. But, you know, obviously, if, if you're playing a, a team like Toronto, yeah, I would love to see it. But you're also... I don't know. It all depends on how you really did during the regular season as well in the matchup. So that's, that's for me anyway. Um, crazy cat. That's interesting. Crazy cat says, are we keeping two $6 million goalies? Uh, Why not? We have one. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know. It seems right now we're going to keep them. Absolutely. We, we can't do anything with them right now, but, uh, but I think they're asking for next year because Swayman isn't $6 million this year. But my answer to that is why not? You've got $21 million in cap space. You're not going to use it. You're not going to use it all. So why not have the best goaltending uh, duo in the NHL for another season? And and beyond that, you go beyond next year when it's expected to jump another four to four and a half million dollars. Then two six million dollar goalies becomes a bargain. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't take long to for that to be a bargain at all. No, uh, you you I, talk I, Arizona moving to Salt Lake City. That's a jump in the cap. That's, right. That's a huge jump in the cap. Um, yeah. go ahead, Parker. Dom, I know. I think with the last time I was on here, we we're talking about this exact same thing about whether the Bruins were going to keep us. It was right after the trade deadline, right? And it was mm-hmm. the big story of Allmark just right up the deadline, not getting traded, right? And and then the question became, you know, why didn't they do it? And one of the big things was, you know, the whole goal of it was to get Swayman at a cheaper deal. You know, at the end of the day, he's a he's a franchise goalie, right? And, and it's hard to say anything other than that for Swayman. But if, if you look at it and he's a tandem starter, he's not that like standalone franchise starter, he's going to take a little bit of a pay cut because he's not a starter role. So I think when we look at it that way, it makes sense to keep Allmark at least past Swayman's contract extension. And then from there, the, maybe the question becomes what's next. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes, it makes sense now. I mean, I'm on the fence about this whole situation when it comes to goaltending. I. Uh, would you know if if all might needs to be moved this off season? I understand it, uh, but I'm also totally on board if he sticks around for his final year, um, because it puts you in a in a really good position if the goal isn't accomplished this year. And the you know the goal to start every season was the Stanley Cup, and they are three games away from starting the postseason. Do I believe that they'll get a cup this year? I don't know. I mean, anything could happen. I'm kind of riding the, hey, this the gravy train this year has been really nice and everything. But if they don't get it, the increased salary cap next season and the position of you having two 1A goaltenders already, then you can build a, a championship team next year, literally. Um, or if you need to trade because the uh, free agency is thin and so on, you have so many things that you can do to really make a a, a, a cup team this year or oh, next year. Sorry. Uh, oh, Sharon, Sharon Dietz. I love this. I love this woman. <laughs> Will the Bruins have a score on the power play? <laughs> God, this reminds me of 2011, and we 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 just acquired um, Thomas Caballet from the Toronto. Um, no, it wasn't from the Toronto. Was it Toronto? Yeah, it was from Toronto. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, we get him for to be the power play specialist, and I don't even think he got a power play goal. <laughs> I uh, think. Anyway. I think just for these last three games, just for the hell of it, throw Kevin Shattenkirk in the bumper position. It works. I, I, yeah, I, I like, I it. mean, you're, you're in London. So you, you know, if you go to the Knights games, you get to see it all the time. Dale Hunter is a big fan of throwing defensemen into the bumper position. He's done it this year with Radic Bonk. Um, not Radic. Wow. Bonk, the Flyers draft. All, all, Oliver Bonk. All, Bonk, oh, Radic right. Bonk's grandson. Son. Oh, grandson. Uh, wow. Grandson. Um, he did it with Evan Bouchard back in the day, put them in the bumper position, and it just works. Kevin Shattenkirk is that kind of defenseman um, where it actually could work. For sure. And, and I think the other thing we should talk about is Oliver Bonk's also very good at scoring goals into his own net. Sorry. That's the, <laughs> that's yeah. the Canada fan talking. Sorry. I got it. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> what, what was it? What was it? Still fuming. 
What was it? What was it? Uh, game three against Flint, didn't he put two into his own net? Did he really? Was game, I, yeah. I was talking about the juniors game. Oh, he did it. He did it in the playoffs in game two or three against Flint in the last round. He put two in his own net. Oh. Right. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Pod snipe Sally. They say Bruins will score multiple power play goals against Ottawa in the season finale. You heard it here. Tune it up. You place a bet on that, Dan. <laughs> Dan, my biggest fear, and I've seen this from the Ottawa Senators too many times as a Bruins fan. The Bruins have something to gain by beating them, and they end up throwing a stinker against Ottawa in the last game of the year, and not and Ottawa just knocks them out of whatever they're trying to do, whether it's get into a playoff spot or win first place or or whatever. That's my biggest fear with the last game being against Ottawa. It is one from a uh, friend, Kevin, who changed his name for some unknown reason. Will Brad stick for the playoffs? Uh, interesting question because Braz is out with an upper body injury. I'm thinking it's either elbow or wrist related. Um, would love to have a guy like that back on the in the lineup, but I don't. I don't know uh, what's going to happen with that. Is it, I guess it's a good thing that he's skating, but he's not like doing a lot of like you know hand work and so on. Um, and he's not completely ruled out. So, I mean, there's, there's, it could be a potential that he could come back, but I'm not a medical guy, so I don't exactly know where we're at with that. Would love to have his big body in front of the, of the opposing net, that's for sure, in, in an upcoming postseason. Like we've seen um, a lot uh, this season with him uh, being recalled or, or signed and brought up to the NHL for his first NHL action. Kevin's been here this whole time, and that's the first I've heard from him. No, no, no. He 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 originally came on with Kevin, his name, and then I think he had to change. I think Facebook might have been screwing up. Oh. Um, what else have we got? Andrew says. Okay, boys, great content as always. My work day is over. Go bees. Nice, thanks. Uh, Swedish chef. I like that. <laughs> we need Braz back. Park his ass in front of the net. The playoffs, garbage goals equals playoff wins. I like that. Um, I'm trying to think of, trying to see. You know what we do need? If anybody is here that wants to be a producer, and do all of this for us? Let me know. Not <laughs> me. I'm computer illiterate. Makes makes two of us. Yes. Everybody that's watching on YouTube, please hit the like button. And subscribe, too, by the way. We would certainly appreciate that. We're trying to grow this uh, YouTube channel. We're doing these. We're going to be doing these live streams uh, every episode. There's a lot of people like Sharon Dietz out there that asked us to do live streams more often. So why not take advantage of catering to people like Sharon? But also we can do the uh, audio podcast for the uh, at the Apple podcast and Spotify and so on. And also cater to the uh, the, uh, the viewers and so on. Freddie Palmer. Uh, what scares me is not enough physical play with this team going into the playoffs. Yeah, we talked about that a little while ago, Fred. Um, I think that it's getting better. It has been getting better, especially since uh, Jim Montgomery uh, put the hammer down, bag skated him a bit, and I think they responded pretty well. I think that they finished their checks a little bit more. Uh, they're more engaged. Um, is it perfect? I don't, I don't think so, but at least they're offering some kind of pulse that they want to be competitive and they want to, you know, be able to, to at least stay in the first round and possibly get into the second round and, and go further. But um, I mean, it remains to be seen I mean, that switch between the regular season and the off season has not been flipped yet. 
So we really don't know what exact team we're going to see. Parker, what do you think? Let's get you involved. I'm sorry if I'm shutting you out. No, no, you're good. Um, I mean, I think just the addition of Maroon too, we, we sort of talked about it already, but just sort of that culture that he provides, right? Is It's just, it's night and day difference. In my opinion, it's going to be, we'll see it in tomorrow's game, uh, likely against the Penguins, but they're a team that it's going to be a playoff atmosphere for them. They're at this point, practically win or go home. So they're going to pull it, put up, put their best foot forward. And I think when we look at it, Boston has to match it. And there's no one, there's no one I'd rather see in a debut than Patrick Maroon to sort of show what the Bruins are going to be made out of in this playoff, sort of start the um, sort of start that, that culture trend for the playoffs to get everyone in that mindset. And I think tomorrow's game is really going to be representative of what we're going to see in the playoffs for Boston. <laughs> Don's been known to whack people. I love it. It's bad. That is Kevin. I'm surprised he hasn't asked me about Nick Ritchie yet. Oh. <laughs> oh. Ray Lang comes in uh, saying, looking at the team we have now and what cap space we will get and the prospects coming up, do we think we will have a powerhouse in a few years? If so, what does it look like? I don't know about a powerhouse. But I think, I don't know, I, Don Sweeney and the, and the scouting staff be, seem to have a niche for finding those under the like the radar type of players um, that come in, they, they, they adjust to the culture, they're happy to be in Boston, happy to be playing for an original six. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think, no, like, like I said earlier, they have a franchise goaltender a franchise defenseman. They've got another defenseman who on a lot of teams would be a number one defenseman. Um, they have a superstar forward, franchise forward in David Pasternak. There's young guys coming. Will they be a powerhouse? I don't know. Depends on your definition of a powerhouse. But they will be competitive and um, you know, you look at the teams that have won the cup since 2011, uh, LA had to go through a rebuild. Chicago had to go through a rebuild. Um, who else? Like St. Louis is now going to go through a, a rebuild. Washington is soon entering a rebuild and the Bruins have remained competitive all along. They just mm -hmm. know how to do it and how to do it right um you know which i'll let parker bring it up uh we talked about it earlier some news regarding don sweeney um oh, yeah. the the man just doesn't get enough credit and so parker take it away sure so i mean always exciting news when there's a little bit of international times boston bruins action and it was just announced today that Don Sweeney will be leading the GM for Canada at the Four Nations Cup, as well as the assistant GM for the Canadian Olympic team in 2026. So big deal for him. Congrats. Um, and well-deserved, too. We've seen with what he can do, what he's done with the Boston Bruins. And he's basically turned a transition year team into a more or less first-place contender. So, I mean, hats off to him. Super well-deserved and uh, certainly gets his fair share of flack. But at the end of the day, he, 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 he gives results. So it's hard to, hard to go against him. Sorry, I had a cough there. Yeah. Oh, uh, geez. Oh, wait. I got to answer Kevin's question. Hold on. I have to get into uniform. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Now I'm scared. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nick Ritchie, he, uh, I was flying back from Germany this morning. You probably saw my video on Twitter racing back from the Toronto airport, right, uh, to get back for the podcast. And I thought, I was at the airport in Toronto, and I thought, you know, just in case Mark gets my shoes uh, on, on the podcast, somehow sneaks them in, I better get them shined. So... I was at the airport, sat in the chair, I was getting my shoes 
shine, checking Twitter on my phone, and I looked up, and who was shining my shoes but Nick Ritchie. Oh, jeez. <laughs> there you oh. go, Kevin. We've gone officially off the rails. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> That's the off. extent of Nick Ritchie's hockey career. I do want to uh, talk about this real quick. Um, Crazy Cat comes in. Too bad we lost Luch. Him and Maroon would have been amazing. Um, you would have never seen Maroon and Luch on the same team. No, I don't uh, think so Mar either. Maroon coming to the Boston Bruins was because of what happened with uh, Milan Lucic. Um, I think the plan was to have Milan involved and be that intimidator type of guy. And when that crap happened, uh, obviously they, they, they left the Boston Bruins with a hole, but they seem to work out uh, a, a decent deal for a guy that is going to, you know, you you look down that bench, you know, you, you're going to know that if you take liberties on, on one of our guys, you're going to have somebody right there. That's, that's going to be definitely taking a number and, and they're going to come out and, and do something on the next shift or maybe a shift after. So, I just don't think that two of those players, and and, not, and I'm not knocking any Justin Brazau. I'm a big Justin Brazau fan, but I cannot see a Boston Bruins team having Maroon, Lucic, and Brazau on the same club. That's just <laughs> you, you just that's not a recipe for success. It, it's very slow, actually. But and I'm not like I said, I'm not knocking players. Um, off the rails, Pod Snipe Sally. Love these guys off the rails. The way to do a podcast, we do it every week. <laughs> um, oh, oh, Jesus, Annie, is that the Unabomber? Oh, God, oh. <laughs> that's terrible. Oh, my God, Angie. Sorry, I called her Annie. Um, anyway, we are coming up on an hour and a half. Um, this is a lot of fun. Um, I think we're going to cap it off right here. Uh, because I've got to uh, change all these TVs to different hockey games and, and start covering those uh, and watching those. So um, uh, quickly, Parker, go around, quickly go around the table. Prediction. The Bruins will finish where in the, in the standings? Second place Atlantic. Yeah. You think Florida is going to pass them? Mark? Uh, I'm going to say first. In the Atlantic or Eastern Conference? First in the Atlantic. I'm going to say first in the East. They're going to pass the Rangers. Ooh, spicy take. Spicy take. Love it. Love it. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, Pod Snipe, Sully, Angie, Beth, Kevin. Um, Andre, everybody that's been in the chat, um, we've got some really good numbers. We truly appreciate this. Um, we're going to be doing this more often. So every episode of the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast will be a live stream so we can get everybody involved. Um, yeah, this is a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully I can hey, guys, how to talk. Be sure to follow this guy, please. He does amazing work. Absolutely. One of the up-and-comers. Uh, so... Yeah, definitely follow uh, Parker at on the fly one five one five on Twitter, and also um, give him a um, a like and a subscribe on his Twitter on, on his um, YouTube channel because uh, he like he's like Dom said he does uh, amazing work. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Um, we'll definitely have. <laughs> Did you see that? Parker, that's yeah, a, that's our boy. That's a uh, <laughs> Parker is adorable. Oh, you should adopt him. <laughs> oh my God. Hey, at least there's no international rates, though. You guys are all in Canada. <laughs> yeah, that is off the no rails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my God. Again, thank you so much to Parker and uh, Dom. As always, thank you so much for doing ninety kilometers home to 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 be here for this live recording. 
And the wind uh, was doing are... 80. Again, yeah, I know, right? So... <laughs> Slow down, you bastard. <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks, but it was Rob. a 60 thanks, zone. Sharon. I was okay. No, yeah. I know. It's the kilometer thing. Once I saw 94, I'm like, dude, Jesus. Yeah, it was a 60 zone. I was okay. It's a podcast. We're not dying here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, too funny. But anyway, I got to I got to wrap this up. I got some Providence Bruins I got to watch. So um, uh, thank you again. Uh, the support's been amazing. We truly appreciate it. Uh, please like and subscribe. We really want to get over a thousand soon. That'd be awesome. Um, and we can only do that by you guys. So um, that being said, we will. Uh, I will converse with Dom, and we might even have uh, another guest come on next week. So uh, you guys want to jump on? And talk Bruins hockey with us. You guys are welcome. Send me an email. Send me a DM and whatever. But um, until then, please be safe. Uh, go Bruins. We might even do an early pod, uh, depending on the end of the season and, and when we actually find out who we're playing. So we might even do like a first round preview. So I'll have to work with uh, with you guys, uh, Dom and so on. And maybe... Maybe if uh, Parker's available, he might be able to join us because I know he's got some some stuff that he can dig up on a, a lot of uh, different things about certain teams and what we need to look for and who's hot and who's not. So what do you think, Parker? Would you be available? For sure. Of course he would. He wrote a four-hour exam today and was still <laughs> here. So <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not gonna lie to you. When he when he first asked me, I was like, absolutely. And then I looked at my calendar. I'm like, oh, <laughs> today might be a long one, but we're here. We're alive. Absolutely. Yeah, there you He's go. a trooper. Definitely worth the follow and a subscribe. So, um, with that being said, I'm the host, Mark Oliver. That is Dom Tiano, and that is guest uh, Parker. Yeah, guys, have a great night. Go Bruins, and um, yeah. here we go. Playoff time, baby. Go Bruins. Go Bees, go. Go 